hello everyone. Uh, my name is, is Duncan McFadden and I head up research and conservation at Oppenheimer Generations. And I'm delighted to introduce to you the, the Tipping Points um, seminar series uh, brought to you by um, Oppenheimer Generations Research and, and Conservation. We are hugely excited about creating spaces for conversations much like this and are committed to you know, creating an conducive environment to drive the, the right types of, of impact. Uh, the Tipping Points uh, webinar series um, has been initiated for creating topical discussions on issues uh, affecting development um, and, the, and the environment in, in Africa. Uh, guided by our approach of, of asking questions that matter, the solution-based webinar series explores how we can step back from environmental tipping points and foster uh, a sustainable future uh, for both Africa's people uh, and, and nature. Uh, every month, thought leaders, disruptors, and researchers will gather to address key questions uh, for Africa's future through an exploration of African environmental research, conservation, sustainability, and of course, uh, development. As I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, these are complex challenges and there's no quick fixes here. Inclusive, you know, conversation that, uh, that shares perspectives, you know, uplifts African narratives, challenges, challenges conservation paradigms, and interrogates possible paths of action is critical in navigating this, as you can imagine, a very complicated and interconnected um, in issues. Every month, key people will be invited to share in these conversations, which I'm sure you, uh, like me, uh, share that excitement and being able to access these webinars. Um, this platform obviously is about listening to diverse uh, voices and opinions because we realize that we do not have all the answers. We do believe that everyone's opinion, of course, is, is valuable. And we hope that, that this platform will foster a healthy and, and constructive uh, discussion and debate around topics um, or themes that have impact um, on, on our lives. This was the inspiration uh, behind the Tipping Points uh, webinar series, which will be brought to you monthly. And even more so, the current topic uh, of this specific webinar that we're having today, building or burning, how can development advance environmental sustainability? Now, as you can imagine, development and environmental sustainability are concepts which are too many irreconcilable conflict. We do not expect to resolve this conflict. We expect that the imperative set by both will persist in shaping our future. And so we are embarking on a series, this exciting series of conversations to inform and challenge the thinking on, on the subject. Um, as you probably all feel, and certainly some of us on the side, development and is it a dirty word? And certainly certain people do feel that way. But it comes with so much baggage that its use can be difficult. Obviously, business, as usual, is not working. And time is running out. And ignoring these issues and hunkering down in comfort zones will simply ensure that nothing, nothing changes. We know that development is a fact. I'm sure everybody, everybody on the webinar would agree with that. It is happening and it will happen faster and faster uh, in the future. And we've got to accept that. The challenge is to engage and co-opt development towards more sustainable pathways. And we have invited fantastic speakers to help us find a way today. The alternative is that development will only stop when tipping points um, are reached and ecosystems will ultimately uh, collapse, those on which we so dearly uh, depend. Is it possible to vision a way of development which is not inherently destructive? 
and which simultaneously simultaneously does not seek to greenwash which the subject which so often happens. There is a magnitude of elements to this debate, as one can imagine. And today's panelists will bring to bear considerations about sustainability and development, and we hope will inform without the expectation of a definitive solution, but we will interrogate implicitly and over time more explicitly the assumptions behind the terms development, sustainability, conservation, and of course, pro progress. The question at this stage, because we have, have a long series of webinars planned for the year, is how to engage with the fraught issues presented in the title above, and to encourage thinking which does not result in the predictable stalemate, which of course, uh, so, so often happens. As I say, I'm really delighted to be introducing uh, our speakers, uh, outstanding, outstanding panelists, um, all pioneers in the field and hand selected uh, to give an interdisciplinary perspective on, on this topic. Our first welcome, and certainly a very warm welcome to Dr. Nadia Sitas. Uh, Dr. Sitas is a transdisciplinary sustainability scientist uh, at the Center of Sustainability Transitions, working within the science policy practice interface on issues relating to socio-ecological re resilience. For over a decade, she has been involved in applied research focused on understanding knowledge exchange and transgressive processes, like, to like the integrating environmental justice into various decision-making uh, contexts. Very important that we have Dr. Cetus here today. Then, secondly, uh, the wonderful Ndoni Nkunu, an internationally recognized climate scientist and social entrepreneur, as well as founder and CEO of Black Women in Science. In her fight for climate action, environmental sustainability, and advocacy in Africa and internationally, she has worked for the Adaptation Research Alliance and Greenpeace uh, International. And finally, our very own, Dr. Emmanuel Rusu Sechere. He's an economist and currently the deputy director of research at the, the Brenthurst Foundation, political think tank. His uh, principal areas in expertise include inclusive growth and sustainable development, poverty and inequality, migration, youth development in Africa, and infrastructure development. So I'm sure you can agree, we've got an absolutely outstanding panel, and I'm really, really looking forward to their presentations. Please be advised that the, the session will run now for, for a 30 minute period, a 10 minute uh, allocation to each of our panelists, followed by a 15 minute uh, question and, and answer se uh, session. But please, please do uh, through this, throughout this period, please uh, direct your, all your questions to the chat box. And obviously we will uh, deal with those um, in that question and answer session. Great. Uh, first up, uh, Dr. Nadia Sitas. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sitas. It's great to have you here, and we look forward to your, your presentation. Over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I feel incredibly honored to be part of one of uh, the, the first sessions. Um, I just want to check that everyone can see my screen. Oops. And thank you. Great. So, um, yeah, uh, as introduced, I'm Nadia Sitas and I'm based at the Centre for Sustainability Transitions at Stellenbosch University. And a lot of my work focuses on this very question that we are going to be grapple, grappling with today and very much from a kind of complexity perspective um, and based on a lot of the projects that I've been working on over the last couple of years. So this presentation will mainly be kind of big picture stuff to set the, the scene for conversations going forward. Um, and I think there's no question that we now live on a human-dominated planet, and our impact on this planet can be felt 
right from the genetic level, so thinking about genetically modified organ organisms, to impacts at the planetary scale, um, which are altering key, uh, key ecological processes, and even beyond as we launch satellites into the sky um, and we start accumulating a whole lot of space waste. So while this development has meant that um, we've been able to, many people have been able to flourish um, and we've achieved, achieved incredible things, it really has come at a great cost to both um, the environment um, and the species that we share this planet with, but also the ability for everybody to enjoy a good quality of life. And we see this in changes, you know, in the climate, the obscene inequality with eight, you know, eight of the richest billionaires owning the same wealth as, as kind of 3.6 um, billion people. Um, uh, and also record number of people uh, forced out of their homes through conflict and crises and just acknowledging uh, the tensions that we're experiencing today and, and sending thoughts to people that are um, yeah, having difficulties at this moment with the tension with Russia and Ukraine. So the topic of this webinar for advancing human development while um, you know, really trying to think about these planetary processes um, and not traversing them is really the next frontier for human development. So what we know from a whole lot of research and a whole lot of science policy assessments that have happened around climate change with the IPCC, uh, the IPBES assessment that is similar that focuses on biodiversity and ecosystem services, and also the, human develop the latest human development report is that the biosphere underpins human societies and economies. And there's no, you know, the, we, we definitely know this, it's fundamental for our thriving lives and economies, for food security, for secure and sustainable water, ensuring we have energy for healthy and productive ecosystems um, and for being able to governance these societies. What we also know is that it's fundamental to these globally agreed targets that we have linked to the sustainable development goals. And while there are only a few of the SDGs that focus on the environment, achieving all of the other SDGs really does depend on maintaining the solid um, environmental focus. So while we know this conceptually, um, one of the most powerful ways to kind of think of this and, and something that I found really, really effective is this beautiful artwork that was an installation um, at, at a conference in Stockholm. And it really also signifies the power of art for bringing in different imaginations of how we see the world. And so essentially it was, it's this um, installation that hangs from a ceiling um, and you can see the big disc at the top uh, represents the environment, the one underneath represents society. Um, and the bottom, there's this um, uh, kind of sphere of coins that represents our economy. And they all connected through these threads. And it was a really powerful metaphor because as you can imagine, if you cut, depending on where you cut at these different threads, different things happen to the system. So if you cut the, the ball at the bottom, which is the economy, you know, the system will reconfigure, will develop new ways of, of kind of managing our money in the world. Um, similarly, if we start cutting the threads between the environment and society, societies will crumble. But if we start um, tampering with the threads that hold this entire system up, the entire installation, and essentially um, our world will come crashing to the ground. And so it's really, you know, a useful metaphor to start thinking about those connections and those threads and who gets to cut those threads. Um, and, and also, you know, which sides of the, the world might tip and who benefits or burdens from from how those decisions are made, but also pre pre presents a unique opportunity for us to think about how we can start re-knitting some of those threads um, and who can be involved in those processes. So what we also know from research is that we're living in this new um, geological epoch called the Anthropocene, which is essentially the age of humans. And um, so in 2015, about 50% of the population lived in cities. If we look at projections, we'll know that about, about 2050, 80% of people will live in cities. Um, and especially, you know, 40% of the world's children by 2050 will live in Africa. So these are really important things to consider as we start embarking on development um, and also provides an opportunity for us to start thinking about what happens when we start cutting away the strings that are holding up nature and really undermining the resilience of the system. And so from work that we've done, we can recognize what does happen um, when we start cutting away these threads. And this was uh, work that was done looking at the role of ecosystem services at providing a buffering capacity against some of these extreme weather events and whether it's kind of increased storm surge, uh, droughts, floods, uh, wildfires, and also increasing human wildlife conflict as, as resources become a lot more scarce. And so one thing that's also really important is the reality of the system that we live in and the deep um, divides um, and inequality um, and, and how nature 
is often a natural insurance for many people that can't afford kind of financial insurance. And so if we start eroding, uh, eroding uh, nature's capacity to mitigate these risks, it potentially puts even more people um, in, in harm. Um, and really important to think about how this inequity perpetuates within kind of decision-making processes, whose knowledge, um, who's invited to the decision-making table, whose knowledge is included, and also how benefits and burdens of development are distributed. So this brings to this whole notion of develop, you know, putting um, the environment or development. Um, and really what we do a lot is, uh, at the center where we work and many of the other people probably on this call is using a social ecological systems perspective. Um, so in order to survive and thrive in this new age, we really do need to redesign the path to progress um, that respects this intertwined nature of people and nature. Um, and so while people and nature are often shown as divided um, and still seen as separate, this really does need to change. And so it's not about choosing between people or nature or the environment or development. It really has to be neither or both. Um, and it shows these co-evolving, our co-evolving fates um, and whether we can be sustainable and equitable into the future is really important to, to consider these systems as coupled. So while this is quite depressing, um, and we know based on the reports and the news that we hear um, that the environment is deeply degraded, you know, there's a mass uh, species extinction also underway, change is possible and it is happening. Um, and we can see this through um, certain, you know, um, new ways of thinking that are emerging. So the systems level thinking is one thing, but also things like convivial conservation, which are moving from kind of protection based methods of conservation to more connection based methods. Um, and a more integrated approach to understanding and practicing conservation. Also on how our economies are thought of around, you know, this notion of donut economics, which focuses on both um, understanding where these thresholds and tipping points are in terms of um, our biosphere and in terms of environmental processes, but also what are the, science, the social foundations that we don't want to transgress either. And really these framings that also show this interconnected nature between humans and the environment and how development needs to consider both of these going forward. There's also a project um, for the Seeds of Good Anthropocenes, which is trying to counter the dystopic narratives that we often have around the future of doom and gloom, and tries to focus on where are these pockets um, of innovation happening and seeds of change that we can start learning about um, and connecting in, in different ways. Um, and then also a whole lot of degrowth movements that are happening around the planet, um, and a lot of the climate, energy, and environmental justice movements, which offer a lot of hope for the rethinking about how development can happen. It's also in some of the projects that we do that are using new ways and really thinking at a landscape level. So a USAID funded project called Resilient Waters that I'm working on really tries to think about, you know, how water flows through a system, how animals migrate, um, don't really respect uh, kind of um, political boundaries. And we really not need to start thinking about how these systems are managed at this landscape level, and especially, uh, you know, the many people that rely on, you know, whether it's water or wildlife economies and bring them into the decision making processes. And it's really important if we, if, especially if we want to start thinking about how to mitigate potential water conflicts. So water is, you know, where water is generated and flows through and make sure that there, all the, the different people in these landscapes have equal opportunities for development um, and don't bear the costs um, of development in one place. Um, and can enjoy a good quality of life. So linked to this is also around systems thinking and not just reacting to the shocks and stresses at the top, but also thinking about um, understanding the root causes. And I'm gonna start rushing because I can see that I'm running out of um, time. But as we start thinking about really going to the surface and the mental model models and paradigms and value system that underpin our decisions, we move from practical to more political decision-making processes. And so this is the role of futures thinking. And again, I don't have time, but we can maybe discuss, but really thinking about how can we reimagine different ways and different pathways that are plural and there's no one future and how can we bring people together to navigate this um, and also think of how we can maintain these safe boundaries. So imagination is really important in these processes and how we bring people together to negotiate and have these discussions. And some of the key people that are often left on the, out of these discussions are the youth. And um, they're the ones that will inherit the future. And we really need to start thinking about how we can bring them into these conversations um, and start understanding their visions of the future um, and build that into decision-making processes. 
So this is just a project that we're busy with. It's a small little punt just to end off in that um, we, yeah, so if anyone is involved, I'd love to hear from you, but it really is trying to make sure that the youth, their visions, um, their experiences um, are brought into um, how we might start thinking about solutions going forward. So thank you very much. Um, I will end there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sitas, for that really insightful presentation and, in, and uh, into the science policy practice interface. And I'm um, really delighted that there are those seeds of change and hope. You know, often there's so much doom and gloom. So that's really, really exciting. And next uh, is Mdoni Mkunu. Uh, thank you, Mdoni. Over to you. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to get my presentation up. Sorry, it was up. That's technology. There we go. Thank God. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation, um, Dr. Nadia, I feel very intimidated right now, but thank you so much for, for giving me this platform, everybody that's here, everyone that knows me and I've worked with, it's such an honor for, to have you here. Um, so today we're talking about tipping points and how do we develop, you know, advanced environmental sustainability. So just a brief introduction into the kind of conversations I've been involved in. I've been working with the Adaptation Research Alliance which is a project that was launched at COP26 by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and South South North. And so my experience really is working with action. So we're very good at talking um, between these two topics, but then when it comes to action, we seem to really struggle. And so that's part of my work. So these are the members for the Adaptation Research Alliance that we've been able to come together. It's almost like um, an alliance where um, researchers and academics funders um, as well as grassroots organizations are all sitting together trying to find the solution and the balance between how do we sustainably grow together support developing countries as well as remain um, you know economically financially correct these are funders like your green climate fund your bill gates um, foundation and all of those people that that really focus on funding so the first question is what are the key issues that we are facing. So I call this the burning, although I know this is not the burning, but I just feel like we're burning, you know, we are just burning. So my focus is going to be on the Southern African impacts and the tipping points that we've got going on there. So the first one that we know is that um, recently the IPCC did state that we might not be meeting the, the, the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius, meaning that we are we at a high risk of reaching a point of climate change and climate impact that can actually be irreversible. And these kind of impacts are, 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 are really hectic. So the first one I would like to look at is the long lasting impacts of droughts. And these droughts have had many um, issues. If you look into um, the key issue of, of water supply, um, currently even in Johannesburg, we don't have enough water. So this kind of issue is affecting our agriculture. The costing of food is, will increase. The, the, the livelihoods of the people that's, that sit in the cities that have um, heat waves that we're expecting and they're staying in informal houses and they do not have air conditioning, this is bound to impact their health and their safety. Um, the second impact is looking at infrastructure. What are our coping capacities? And so we know that we're, as we live in South Africa, we have very have a lot of underserviced facilities and we have limited options as to how we adapt to these projects and how we adapt into these changes. So a recent article, and I think we've seen it in the news, is the flooding that has happened from these extreme weather events in the Eastern Capes killing four, 14 um, people, which, which is very sad. So this talks about infrastructure, this talks about the challenges and the key issues we have. When it comes to development, where we should be developed or developing, but we still have issues like this. And how do we balance these, these issues of infrastructure? Um, and then we look into the energy costs and, and, and energy and the supply of energy. We know that companies like Sasso are a major provider into the GDP and how, and how our country goes. Our main supplier of electricity is Sasso. So now here's this debate on, on how do we manage these energy costs as well as our economy growing um, and, and, and how do we actually find the, the balance of where we are gonna go to. 
So I'm going to focus on the next steps. And this is where I call the building. And so what are the solutions? So how can we move towards an inclusive and a sustainable way of developing in the future? My suggestions, not the, not the way. Um, the first one, if I have to focus on research and development, and so when we look into the knowledge sharing and the hierarchy of knowledge, um, a recent article by the BBC News stated that fewer than 1% of authors were based in Africa from the most from the hand, from 100 most highly cited um, papers on climate change. So there's a there's a there's a information challenge we've got going on on what are we feeding and who's feeding us and who's saying what. And then only 12 of those papers had female lead researchers. Of course, I'm going to be biased on that. And then as well as um, you know, so this goes back into what knowledge do we see as important when we are designing infrastructure models, when we're designing models to adapt into the extreme weather events, who's saying what and who are the leading authors that are making sure that we are actually looking out to mitigate rather than to adapt. And so um, within ARA, um, one of the projects that we focus on is climate action projects that link grassroots organization that are tailor-made for Africa are, are very important when we're speaking about implementing projects on the ground. So the first project I'm going to go quickly through is the DEVIL project, which is my PhD, um, excuse the pun. And so um, this project really looks at how do we integrate the food system? So within the extreme weather events, small-scale farmers, and this is pictures from the ground where we were on the ground trying to understand how do we deliver food on limited land. And this was a Belmont Forum project. And here we were working with uh, local farmers as well as working with funders, um, Belmont Forum, as well as working with emerging researchers like me and established researchers like um, Professor Bob Scholes. And all of, all of this um, network is trying to find a solution as uh, Dr. Nadia said, in the systematic way of thinking or as she said, a future, future thinking. The second project is part of a project part of the ARA. This is called Glomus Project. And you know, this project is such a brilliant project. It looks at how to capture and conserve mangroves um, in developing countries. Now, the challenge is when you search Glomus, will you actually find them? And you won't find them. You won't find enough information that's going to give you enough information on how do they manage to, you know, um, reserve their data, conserve their data, as well as grow um, the communities and and as well as grow the economy. And so this is the problem with developments in Africa is how we capturing data, how we sharing information, how we building projects and, and, and how we go to make sure that it's sustainable, not only in a word perspective, but also in a financial perspective. And so in the, the my final slide is looking at the, the solution of economy and, and looking at leadership. And so here it's about understanding um, funding mechanisms for investment and sustainable development. So when we talk internationally, and this was part of the project um, for Bill Gates Foundation, they had a, 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 an amazing um, plan. And they said, you know, we've been working with these communities for 10 years to develop them sustainably. And now it's time for us to come out. And, and when, when, when it's time for them to pull their funding, what kind of developments are in place for them to be able to be sustainable with and with with or without their funding so um they pose that question and so my question here is that once we become into these debates and bilaterally when i was engaging with these organizations then they say all right we want to fund ad adaptation projects or sustainability projects but how do you and so we need to understand how do we design our funding models that can financially support communities as well as develop our countries technologies and skills development Renewable energy, um, gas to liquid technologies, as well as ecotourism are very important um, when we are coming to how do we sustainably develop our country. So this is an, uh, uh, an article I've been recently co-authored with, which is looking at also the solutions of how do we uh, manage extreme weather events and the changes as well as develop. Um, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Ndoni, for a fascinating and interesting presentation. And certainly what is inquired in terms of climate action and environmental sustainability, I bet people are dying to ask you questions. Please just a reminder, please use the chat box. Um, it's there and then we'll, when we get to the question on secession, we will answer your questions or the panelists will. Then lastly, Dr. Emmanuel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you for inviting me to the mailing session of this seminar. 
Let me try sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep, can see it. Okay, so I'm gonna be discussing a few, a few an, an excerpts from, from a previous project I did with the Indian Ocean Rim Association, um, where we looked at the, um, a handbook for, for, for the blue economy, for, for, for Indian Ocean or coastal states. And I authored chapter four, being the achieving sustainability in the context of the blue economy. And uh, basically, the concept of sustainability has been dynamic, or is dynamic, uh, from the Club of Rome in 1972 that talked about the limits to growth, where they identified five factors uh, whose interaction and exponential growth uh, would have consequences for the sustenance of the Earth, uh, to the Cocoyoc Declaration 1974 in Mexico, uh, where they described sustainability as a, a relationship between the limits, inner limits of human needs and the outer limits of the Earth's resources thereby identifying uh, an, an anthropocentric dimension to it with a human-centered dimension to it, and an ecocentric or ecology-centered dimension to the concept of sustainability. Uh, to the 1987 WCED uh, definition of, of developing today uh, without taking away the capacity of the future generations to develop, uh, they brought a future dimension, added a future dimension to the anthropocentric dimension and the ecocentric eco dimension of the concept of sustainability. Now, these three dimensions are not, are not mutually exclusive. Uh, nature does give back, nature does feedback, nature does respond to irresponsible human behavior, although the, the, the responsibility for sustainability is primarily human. Nature does respond, and that, that makes you realize that the relationship between the environment and development is, is, is not mutually exclusive. It's, it's a very active relationship. Um, nature does respond in terms of uh, global heating, rising sea levels, floods, tsunamis, typhoons, and, and what have you. Now, why do the oceans matter? Why, why are the oceans important? Now, the oceans uh, cover about 75% of the Earth's surface. Um, it, it produces about $3 trillion worth of value every year. Uh, it absorbs, actually uh, absorbs 30% of global carbon emissions. It's the primary source of uh, food security or protein for 3 billion people. It employs 200 million plus people. And 40% and, and of the world's oceans are heavily affected by human activity. You have pollution, depleted fisheries, the loss of coastal habitats, etc. <coughs> so the oceans do matter and form quite a significant part of, of human existence. Now, the oceans hold tremendous potential for economic development, job creation, industrialization, and all the lofty uh, developmental goals that we have as nations. There are some very strong industries in the ocean economy. You have fisheries, you have seabed mining, you have oil and gas, you have shipping. 90% uh, of the world's trade is through shipping. You have post infrastructure service, you have tourism as well. Uh, you have pharmaceutical industries, you have R&D, uh, and, and quite, quite, quite a number of others. This is just a brief, a brief uh, um, summary of the few of the industries in the ocean's economy. Now, apart from the benefits of the ocean economy, there are also challenges. If you take fishing, for instance, the use of chemicals and drugs and herbicides and fungicides um, actually pollute the rivers and, and the world's oceans. And you have pollution and its attendant health hazards uh, for the communities, local communities. There's overfishing, there's escaping fish. If you take oil and gas industry, the oil spillages that are totally disgusting if you see one on any beach or in any country, uh, the construction of the infrastructure itself, the shipping itself, the oil drilling extraction infrastructure itself has strong pollution dimensions to it. Uh, the release of gas at sea uh, during storage and shipping also pollutes the, the oceans significantly. If you take shipping, <coughs> and I, as I said earlier, 70% of the world's, or almost, yeah, seven, out of almost 90% of the world's trade is done through shipping or by sea. There's carbon emissions equivalent to 3% of global human emissions through shipping. There's acoustic pollution. The, the breaking ship itself is an act that tries to recover and recycle ion, copper, and other very dangerous uh, substances and material that all pollute the oceans significantly. If you take coastal tourism, besides the social externalities, uh, you're talking about plastic pollution and filth in the oceans and, and, and coastal cities. So there are challenges with, with, with the ocean economy or with the environment from the blue economy besides this enormous uh, economic industrialization benefits. There are also institutional challenges. Um, the first thing is the pluralism of, of definitions. You hear about ocean economy, blue economy, uh, some call it greening the ocean economy. It's, it's, it's a whole confusion out there how is, what exactly the blue economy is and how it should be defined. And out of how it should be defined, how that informs, uh, you know, regulation, uh, standards, harmonization of standards, measurement indicators, 
frameworks for monitoring the evaluation of the health of the oceans. And, and, and it, it, it's a major challenge there. There's a very low human financial and technological capacity in coastal states for blue economy research. And so the, water, the World Water Forum Baltic Ecoregion Program uh, tried to, to define the blue economy that nations could work with. And they tried to capture all the different dimensions of the ocean economy. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to read their definition that they gave. It provides social, uh, it's, a, it's a marine based economy that provides social and economic benefits to current and future generations by contributing to food security, poverty eradication, livelihoods, income, employment, health, safety, equity, and political stability. So you see the, all the development aspirations listed there. And again, they say it restores, protects, and maintains the diversity, productivity, resilience, core functions, and intrinsic value of marine ecosystems, the natural capital upon which its prosperity depends. And it's, it's, a, it's an economy that's based on clean technologies, renewable energy, and circular material flows to secure economic and social stability over time while keeping within the limits of one planet. Now, although these, these definitions kind of capture the most of the dimensions of the blue economy, it is yet to be universally accepted. It's yet to translate into a precise set of standards, measurement indicators for monitoring and evaluating the health of the oceans over time. So how do you measure impact? How do you assess the, the, the relationship between the environment and the blue economy? How do you measure impact? Now, economic models, there are a number of models, economic models, social models, environmental models. Economic models view sustainability from a, from a, from a perspective of returns on investment, uh, fiscal, fiscal and financial uh, capital, human capital, natural capital. Um, you have, if you take fiscal and human capital, you're looking at total factor productivity of capital and labor. Um, working the, the ocean's economy. You're looking at uh, the value out of the ocean's economy to GDP, like fisheries, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, seabed mining, tourism, renewable energy resources, etc. Yeah, economists also want to look at how much jobs have been created by the sector. Uh, some IORA countries have in their national income accounting statement what they call the green GDP, uh, a net change in GDP relative to the loss in natural resources. In other words, like biodiversity, habitat, climate, how much of the environment was lost in producing the output that you produced. <clears throat> and this seems to be consistent with uh, promoting sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth uh, as uh, which speaks to SDG goal eight. Okay. In terms of social dimensions of assessing the impact, normally if you create jobs, then the, the idea is that you would have addressed, you have helped to address poverty eradication. If, if, you, if you provide food security, then it's supposed to help address hunger. Uh, from, from, from our physical industries in, 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 the, in the ocean economy, uh, it's supposed to ensure healthy lives and promoting well-being for all ages. Uh, we're talking about inclusive and equitable access to quality education and promoting long learning, uh, long uh, lifetime, lifelong learning for all, empowering girls and women, ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation. So the social dimension also has its own uh, variables that could be used to assess the impact of the ocean economy on, on, on the environment. In terms of the environmental dimension, that's where you have the biggest challenge. Um, there are still challenges about, there are lots of methodologies and proposals for value natural capital and ecosystem accounting globally. Uh, none of them is universally accepted yet and implemented by all nations. So there are lots of thoughts and patterns and intellectual uh, innovation happening there. The challenge remains that what do you measure and how are you measuring it and which data are you keeping or which variables are you keeping data on and what is universally accepted or not. So that's where the challenge is uh, in terms of the environment specifically. Um, other, the social and economic dimensions seem much easier and, and already exist in different dimensions before the issue of SDG even came up. So the environmental dimension is a major challenge and that, that we need to look at very critically. Okay, now five key actions um, I was asked to find uh, and with five key actions that I think should, should be done. The first of all, there has to be clear universally accepted definition of what the blue economy is or what the ocean economy is. And that must translate into harmonized regulations, standards, guidelines, and best practices for monitoring, evaluating, and enforcement. Uh, there should be, it should be possible to share knowledge across, across regions, regions and also some capacity strengthening. You'll find that in some countries, the research on the environment is by very small, widely spaced, sparsely scattered uh, research centers that are very ill-resourced. So the, the, the possibility of knowledge sharing and capacity strengthening is a major challenge. We need to design comprehensive indicators to measure uh, desired outcomes after actually coming to a consensus on what our desired outcomes are and how are they defined. And then one big challenge that's always been in Africa and with everything else, not just the environment, is, is keeping accurate high-frequency data. We need to make sure that we're able to do that uh, very well. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, a lot of food for thought there and certainly in, great insights into the blue economy, sustainability and institutional challenges. Uh, now into our question and answer session. Uh, again, please keep the questions coming via the chat box. Where possible, state who the question is for. Uh, great. Um, firstly, I've got a question, and, and that is, the reality is development is happening whether we like it or not. Um, the question is, how do we drive development into pathways that benefit and or support nature? I suppose, Emmanuel, you're probably best placed there. Well, th thanks, Duncan. Um, I wasn't hoping to get the first question. From <laughs> 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 well, the fact remains that um, the relationship between human activity, green development, and the environment, and uh, the need to be responsible for, in the interest of our own survival, uh, it's something we cannot run away from. But nature does give feedback. You see the rising levels, the tsunamis, the floods, and the typhoons that we just had recently, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi. Um, South Africa has been lucky, we just have some heavy rainstorms so far. Um, so, so nature does respond in a very negative way. There has to be very strong um, regulations that are, and the cap capacity to monitor, evaluate, and enforce compliance. Mm. To make sure that development activity, economic activity uh, is carried out responsibly uh, with full respect for the environment, without damaging the environment in which we live, and also without uh, denying future generations of the ability to develop on their own through the same natural resources. Uh, the fishery sector has, has regulations on fishing, restrictions on fishing. So they do that very well, where, 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 where certain types of nets are not allowed because it catches younger fish or smaller fish, so posterity is kind of damaged. So we need to have ways of checking practice and make sure that policy translates into regulations that oversee practice and, and enforces compliance to regulate later regulations that are universally accepted by all and, and ensures responsible behavior. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, we have some questions from the chat box and uh, which we'll answer or put you, put you for answering. Uh, first from Dr. Leslie Marissa. Hi, Leslie. Um, how can a, the holistic approach be engraved in wildlife conservation policy? to deal with the increase due to human wildlife conflict in areas where there are populations that have exceeded the carrying capacity. Uh, elephants in Zimbabwe, where more than 33,000 households and 101,000 people have their food security threatened by human wildlife conflict. Who would like to take that question from Leslie Marissa? I can take a stab at it, um, but then it would be great to hear other perspectives as well. I think this is this is a huge problem, and I think it's also, um, yeah, it, it really does link to to some of the notions on on kind of equity and how the benefits and burden. So everyone wants to have megafauna; they want to have the elephants, the carnivores in our landscapes. Tourists love to see them, but they don't bear the costs of their destructive behaviour. Um, and so there's some interesting conversations around how could we do this differently and how can we ensure that people, you know, we both want to conserve those species, they have a right to exist and to move freely through landscapes as they always have, but also protect the rights of people. And so there's some interesting things around a basic conservation income grant. So people living alongside these areas that have high biodiversity value also earn some money from being able to kind of coexist in those spaces and that might present some additional opportunities to uh, contribute to their livelihoods. Um, I think there are also um, other types of agreements that need to be made across kind of the global scale. So how can we get people that are really interested in keeping these species involved in, in some of the ways that communities, you know, uh, where I don't know if it's through some innovative um, funding schemes, to also provide other opportunities for people to then implement some of the measures that are quite successful at 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 least mitigating some of the human wildlife conflict. But I think it just does bring into question also some of the big dynamics of you know, urban migrations, rural populations, um, those spaces are going to get more and more constrained 
Um, and especially if we start thinking about the need to ensure that we have this diversity because it is so important for future resilience. But at the same time, there are only a few people that bear the costs of, of living adjacent to nature. And really they need to be brought more into the decision-making processes because at the moment, in many places, it's decisions that are being made elsewhere um, and they're being enforced um, or at least expecting people to, to kind of live in harmony where actually their daily lives are disrupted. So I think, in my opinion, um, a rights-based approach, I think a human rights-based approach to any decision-making process can greatly, um, yeah, can greatly change some of the, the dynamics that we see. Great, thank you, Dr. Sidas. Uh, question from Janita. Uh, infrastructure in South Africa is a multifaceted problem New infrastructure needs to be built and old infrastructure needs to be maintained. And the engineers and other specialists need to be here and not overseas to do the planning. Add to the lack of proper funding, what is the proposed solution? Um, okay, I guess, <laughs> since we got <laughs> down, <you>, <laughs> um, Okay, so, I think beyond the solution here is um, really going into um, the skills and development training that we need to do when it comes to our upcoming um, researchers as well as the ones that are currently in. So the engineers that are already on the ground right now, what kind of environmental training do they get? Do they get included in discussions of, of in, um, restoration or are we still sitting in our silos and saying that, we are, you know, um, integrating buildings and sustainable, but scientists have their own way and engineers have their own way. And nobody is actually, it's, it's, it's actually more, we're all sitting in the same room, but we're all not discussing or we're not learning from each other. So um, other proposed um, solutions could be co-creation spaces where we're finding that, you know, we have these kind of discussions where, you know, um, the engineers are sitting there and saying, but we didn't know there was an issue. And the scientists or the environmentalists are saying that there is an issue and, and we, we, get, we get there. Um, as well as, as Africa, you know, we have um, from the Paris Agreement to have a right of developing developed countries to invest into our countries. Um, to, to find ways in which we can build and build infrastructure that can, that can mitigate the impacts of climate change. But if you notice that the, the discussion in COP26, notice that a, a billions of the money that they had committed to, they hadn't actually committed to and paid for. So there's just a need for us as well to be able to understand what are our rights when it comes to these kind of emissions as a continent, what are the responsibilities of developing countries, and we need to stop playing the back end and saying, oh, well, you know, we don't have, we have informal housing, but rather say, look, this is what she said. We write about it, we speak about it, we advocate about it. So those are just the ways that I would suggest. Okay, thank you, Ndoni. And then a question from Alana Rebello, I suggest for Dr. Sitas. How do you define youth? And have we considered the challenges associated with this as well? This idea of involving youth is important, I'm not discounting that, but we also have to be so careful. Youth can be so easily influenced from one side to another. The case of fighting to save invasive trees in the, in the Cape Town is one in point. Some teachers have taught kids that the oversimplified narrative, the trees are good or equal good, and the youth then absorbs this info, whether it's right or wrong. So how would we avoid these pitfalls? Yeah, thanks for that great question. And Alana, I see you've raised a couple of other questions that maybe we can also tackle going forward. I, I, I'm not gonna define youth. I think the debate is still <laughs> out there. You know, there are many different categorizations around youth, uh, whether that goes up to 35, I'm not sure. But what we've defined as youth, and some of it is, you know, just procedurally easier, to not work with school children. So the, the youth in our project are from eight, 18 year olds to 30 year olds. And we've also done this because of this youth bulge um, and especially in terms of unemployment, they come from school um, and many of them are sitting, especially in a lot of the communities where we're working. Um, yeah, with quite a disillusioned vision of what their future might look like. They're gonna be influenced by people, you know, and by media and by stories that they hear, you know, whether we like that or not. But, but I think what, what we found is really important is to bring them into conversations and to actually hear what they know, how they feel, how they experience the world. 
um, and especially how they connect with nature. A lot of the, the, the youth that we are working with are from living in informal settlements that are devoid of nature. Um, you know, they're devoid of municipal services, they're devoid of nature, and really trying to um, run processes that are very immersive, quite creative, getting them to think about systems, so how, you know, we're using plastic pollution as an intervention point to think of that moves from a system, so both from kind of source to sea, catchment to coast, um, to get them to think about those connections, their part in the system, their experiences, provide opportunities to be in nature, to understand coastal systems and processes, but also to use arts-based processes as a form of healing, because um, I think there's a lot of trauma that, that, that um, young people have in their daily lives, um, but also as nature is a healing space. So both to do that and then to surface some of their visions of the future. And these are probably not visions that we have, but I think it's really important to at least hear and give them spaces that are safe so that they can articulate what their visions for the future might be and use those to start having conversations around how we can bring the environment, development, equity, justice, into those spaces as well, so that they can leave from those processes and start having further conversations with other people as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Citas. Uh, then a question from Stephen Woodbourne. Uh, hi, Stephen, I think a great question. In South Africa, we have some perfectly adequate policies that should protect the environment while ensuring development and personal act act actualization. They're in, these are increasingly being seen as anti-business and anti-development. And the application of this policy space is being compromised, mainly to the detriment of the environment. The problem is implementation, which is a common issue, I know, and political will. Can we genuinely influence policymakers with facts and science? I worry that this is a failed pathway. Who would like to tackle that, that question? Let, let, let me, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Um, I agree with him 100%. The problem being that the development of the policies is not inclusive. It doesn't involve all the parties that should be involved. The second challenge is that it doesn't, the capacity to translate that into an implementation framework is not there. So most of the time you have a beautiful document and not, that's not just South Africa, you have the whole of the African continent. Uh, you, have, you have a beautiful document that has no implementation plan, has no work plan. So how do we, work, how do we implement this? How do we do this for real on the ground? It, it's just not there. So, so that, that's one challenge that you have with, with, with the, and so there's a huge dis, uh, disjoint between policy and practice. What is done on the ground has absolutely no relationship with what we say we're gonna do on paper. So, so there, there has to be that the correction of that disjoint from right from the beginning of the, of the design of the policy being inclusive to having a workable implementation framework and making sure that practice aligns with, with policy objectives and outcomes. I'm sorry if I could add, Duncan. Um, you know, I've just read, um, you know, with this question is so brilliant. The challenge that I also think is, is a communication. As a scientist or policy writers, um, when we are writing the policy, who are we writing it for? For who must read it and who must interpret it? And so we never ever associate the, the target crowd of, of where do we want it to end up? And we just write, right. like communicate it. We don't come up with videos. We don't come up with, you know, ways in which to engage public and to engage because the more mm. public are involved, the more there's like a hype around it and the more there's pressure on leaders to, to do the change. And so it's important that we also take responsibility in our role in that how are we training policy writers? Are we communicating it right? Are we also encouraging a, a holistic involvement of, of communities in, in implementation of, of such policies? Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Manuel and Doni. That's great. A question from Katie Roxburgh. The South African government is currently opposed to the global goal of protecting 30% of the world's land and sea by 2030, despite scientists and data showing this is an absolute minimum requirement to halt further biodiversity loss. There have been several studies, including one by Sambi's Amanda Driver, that highlights the incredible scope for job creation through the management and expansion of protected areas, but this does not seem to be landing with policymakers. Kind of links to the previous question, but how can we better articulate that biodiversity protection is good for business and good for employment? 
I think I'll leave that for Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> I can just comment on that. Um, yeah, and you know, 30% is a conservative estimate. Some people are saying 50%. There's a whole kind of half earth movement that say we have to set aside right. half of the earth for conservation. <coughs> and I think that brings back to equity. Like, where are these spaces that this is supposed to happen? And if you look across the globe, where most of the biodiversity now sits is in the global south. Um, and what does it mean if we suddenly are putting, you know, protective mechanisms in those places that people can no longer use the resources? Because there's an overlap between, you know, where people are completely reliant on their natural resources for their livelihoods. Um, and suddenly we say, well, actually, you can't use it anymore because globally we need to protect these goals. So I definitely think we need to pay attention to protecting biodiversity. But it, it just it, it means that we have to start asking very important equity questions of, who gets to decide where these places are, what kind of funding mechanisms can be, be used to, to support the livelihoods um, that will be lost if suddenly people are excluded from places. But maybe there are new mechanisms that you know, aren't focused on exclusion, but are bringing people into kind of community-based conservation initiatives instead, um, and making sure that you know, the, the agency um, is there with the people that are having to live with this wildlife, which links back to you know, that question on human wildlife conflict. Um, because if we are asking the, the people in the world where this biodiversity is, but we're not giving them any of the resources, the power, you know, and the political will to actually protect them, then we're just setting, you know, a whole lot of people up for, for, future, for future failure, both for people and for the environment as well. Absolutely. Another burning question from Alana Rabello. <laughs> uh, likewise, this concept of parks without fences also sounds great, really utopian. However, it is in direct tension with other views like half earth. While I would absolutely love to believe that we could live in great, such great sustainable harmony with nature, uh, what is sustainability, sustainable use? Does it actually exist? Who defines those thresholds? And who will monitor to make sure that the actual extraction does not exceed what is sustainable? It is not just greenwashing to make people feel better. Is it not just greenwashing to make people feel better about development? Really good question. Emmanuel, would you like to take that? I think I can take the latter part of the question. The first part, I'm not going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes down to the, uh, the challenge of um, monitoring and evaluating and enforcing compliance regulatory oversight. It, it's a major challenge in, in, uh, in many developing countries. So it's difficult to trust the businessman to extract within limit because he's thinking about maximizing profit, minimizing costs, optimizing outcomes. So without any strong compliance enforcement, it, 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 that, that's not gonna happen. Uh, businessmen think about mm -hmm. private benefits and private costs, not about social benefits and social costs. So there has to be strong, uh, strong compliance enforcement to well laid out and flexible regulatory frameworks. Otherwise, that's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Emmanuel. Any other comments before we close the question on secession? Maybe just in closing, I think, you know, it goes to the environmental justice movement, climate justice. Where are the impacts of this great acceleration and change being felt? Um, who has been responsible for it and who's going to be part of the solution going forward. And I think while we can, you know, sp shine a spotlight on some of the development and environmental challenges here, they're connected to this bigger system. And we need to radically start changing the way we consume, produce things, um, if we want to start seeing changes happen. And I think we always, you know, a lot of the, the mitigation efforts or adaptation efforts are now in the global south, whereas, you know, they weren't the ones responsible for the problem. So we really need to start holding people accountable for the changes that we see and make sure that people are able to develop in ways um, that are different and leapfrog on some of the in innovation that has been happening in other parts of the world. But that also needs to be um, kind of financed properly and resourced properly. Um, yeah. And yeah, just to say that also, you know, creative futuring tools are really important for that because we're not gonna develop in the same way that other places have, and we shouldn't develop because it's only been a disaster, but we seem set in our ways to value nature in very similar ways um, that, that have been done before. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you once again to all our fantastic panelists. I think it's been a 
a really great discussion and thank you to everyone attending and for the thought-provoking questions that were sent through.